right? Um, one of the things that we see is innovations actually exist in the north before they ever come down to Italy. And actually many of the Italian masters were very much inspired by what was taking place in the north. And so often we call this um, like the Giotto work of Lamentation, we often talk about this being like late Gothic or proto-Renaissance. Um, it's a lot of the stuff that starts to inspire those artists. Um, and so we're going to be looking at innovation and experimentation in 15th century Northern art. Remember that this is all taking place pretty much in the 1400s, right? So, Humanism. Do you guys remember we talked about humanism when we talked about the Greeks and we see it come about again in what we call the Renaissance. Does anyone remember the basics basis of um, humanism? Can anyone give me a, like a very generic definition of what humanism means? You can either do audio or chat. You could look it up. So hopefully someone was just like too intimidated to um, come up with it, but um, it is man can achieve, man can achieve. And so during the 1400s, we see a rise of the middle class. We mentioned that already. Uh, we have an increase in art patronage. You know, by the time you get to a point where you're not scraping for food all the time and you're not um, living completely in hardship and having to like migrate all around to get resources, um, when you move to cities and you start to have more wealth, um, you start to have more time and money for things like art. So we see um, middle class and upper class people being, becoming patrons of arts, not just royalty or the church. We have a revival of classics um, during this time period. And that's one of the major influences of why we have a rise of humanism again. This idea that an individual person can achieve greatness with hard work and perseverance. So the Renaissance, right, is really defined as a rebirth of cultural and intellectual achievements. And so often they look back to classical Rome and classical Greek as their inspiration. We have the rise of the liberal arts, connections of religion and intellectualism. So that's basically trying to rationalize the world through religion. And then we have an interest in the natural world. So the reason that's a big deal for art is that things tend to become much more realistic. In the Middle Ages, we often have things in Byzantine intentionally looking fake. Right? They're supposed to feel otherworldly. And when artists start to look at real people and real flowers, things become much more realistic. So if you remember the theme from yesterday, this idea of observe the bean sprout, it really is based on observing the natural world. Right? So we're going to be looking at Flanders and the Low Country today. And so really, you can see that that's pretty much modern day like Belgium and parts of Holland. Um, and the, or ne the Netherlands, I should say, as well as Luxembourg. Um, the patrons are patrons of religious as well as secular art. So secular means it's non-religious, right? And we have wealthy trade. Some of the first examples I'm going to show you are for, um, the patrons are French dukes, and they were the brothers um, of the King of France. And so they were all kind of living out um, in their different domains, in their countryside retreats, and they became patrons of the local artists as well as international artists. Um, there's also a lot of civic pride. So people had a lot of pride in where they came from. And so often large pieces were commissioned for cities such as Ghent. And so we'll look really briefly today at the Ghent altarpiece. Um, and places like Flanders um, 
was powerful because it was a major trade city. So there was a lot of money and wealth coming through um, these territories even early in the 13, 1400s. A lot of times we think of like the Netherlands and Dutch society um, during the Baroque period, but we can see that it's being established even as early as um, the 1300s. And like I said, these artists were often revered by the Italian painters that we probably know their names a lot more, right? We know Leonardo, right? Everyone knows Leonardo, but not everyone always knows um, some of these other artists, okay? Um, these artists in the North are the first to really use and revolutionize the use of oil paint. We haven't seen it yet. And so with oil paint, they're able to get even more and more realism. So here's some examples of some of those Flemish pieces. You can see how they reflected their own world that they were living in. So often when you look through windows, so like if you look through the windows of the Ghent altarpiece, you'd actually see modern day Ghent through the windows. So you'd actually see Gothic architecture. In the Marode altarpiece, you see Gothic architecture. You see people and patrons and the styles of the day um, in their artworks. And in this work um, for the Duke of Berry, one of the French um, uh, dukes, um, you can see how it's showing the society in which he lived. But you know, one of the other things you'll notice is just the incredible amount of detail that's incorporated into these pieces. Right? So, we don't have, oops, sorry. Um, we don't have a lot of pieces and I don't wanna to dwell too much because I wanna give you time to review for your quiz today as well. But during the 1300s, 1400s, we often think of about an international style. Now this term international style is gonna come up a lot. If something is international, we see it happening in multiple lands at the same time. So like today, we live in an international style of art and architecture. If I went to a city like Chicago and I looked at buildings, the new buildings are in what we call the international style. If I went to Shanghai and I saw a building that was being built, it might be even more innovative than Chicago, but it's still in this international style of you know, a sense of vertical or decoration that's much more flamboyant um, and less like block-like or simplified. And so we see styles that um, reach the world. And that really speaks to the global society in which we live today. Um, but in Gothic times, we talked about styles, like if we looked at the Golden Haggadah, right? Remember from the other day with the Golden Haggadah, that it's, even though it's from Spain, it looks very much French. And so things of this international Gothic style typically had these characteristics. Some of them we will see in the Marode altarpiece. So we have a lot of slender, graceful posed figures. We have delicate features. They often have beautiful curly hair, um, brocaded fabrics, which basically means that the fabrics look like velvet and then they look like they have stitching of gold and other colors embellishing them. Um, elaborate jewelry, landscapes in miniature, room and architecture in miniature. We had that with things like the Golden Haggadah as well as um, the Bible Morales. Remember how all the architecture is like super tiny and super small? Um, we have that as part of this international style. In the north, they loved details in particulars. And so they would put details in the strangest things. They might incorporate a fly buzzing or a bee buzzing around flowers. And the bee would have so much detail that it would look like you could see the dew on the wings of the bee, right? So they're just gonna have lots and lots of details in microscopic details. So leaves, insects, flowers, etc. Another strange phenomenon that you see in this bottom image is tilted horizons or tilted floors. Can you see how the floors have this strange perspective? One of the reasons for this is that um, linear perspective hasn't been discovered or found yet, but also if you tilt the floors, you can show more visual information. I can see more 
elements of that layered space. I can see all these symbols and objects that are incorporated into those spaces. Um, we have high horizons, which means that your horizon line is high in the composition, which allows for those tilted floors. Um, there's a lot of light and bright colors, and then also showing interiors and exteriors at the same time. So remember in the Golden Haggadah how you can like see through the building, right? You can see into the room. That's a characteristic of this international Gothic style. Okay, so it's very common um, in this um, time period for painters to paint um, altar pieces. And so an altar is, of, cor of course, we've talked a lot about Christian faith so far. And so the altar is where we'll have the Eucharist, we might have a um, illuminated manuscript, um, we might have other implements that are used for mass. And often above the table that kind of houses all the paraphernalia that you would need for church service, there would be decoration behind it. And so in that altar piece, you can see how the elements of the, of the construction are very Gothic, right? They have gable peaks, sharp points, lots of finials, but they might be divided into multiple sections. So if it's two, we call it a diptych, right? If it's three, we call it a triptych. And then if it is, has a lot more panels to it, they call it a politic, right? And so um, some of the examples that we see are gonna be, so like the Marode altarpiece that we have today is a triptych. It has three panels, right? So this is not in the 250, but you can see how this is a diptych, right? It has two panels and you can see how these paintings once upon a time would have been inserted into another wooden frame inside a church. And so they often have scenes from the New Testament, um, but you can see how there's a combination of um, architecture and landscape together. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this one because we don't have it in our image set, um, but there's a lot of hidden symbolism in these pieces. And here's a great image of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus leaving for Jerusalem. And you can see um, all this detail. Notice um, Joseph, right? Joseph has like a scraggly beard, right? And he's drinking water. There's lots of like little details in story making. Um, one of the Dukes of Berry um, made a monastery dedicated to him. So he, upon his death, would have all these monks praying for his salvation. And this Moses well um, was made for um, that setting. And so we, I just wanted to show you really quickly that we're going to primarily look at painting, but it doesn't mean that we don't have super realistic sculpture coming out of this time period as well. When I look at something like this, I could completely see the influence on people like Leonardo and Michelangelo, who were master sculptors. Notice how all these characters on this well look different. They don't look like the same person over and over again. And then the last thing, because it's always fun to mention, this is Moses. What does Moses have that's a little strange? Oop. What does Moses have that's a little strange? Jeffrey, what do you think? What's a little odd about Moses, the guy in the center? There's like bumps on his head. He, he does. In the early translation of the Bible, um, actually, I shouldn't say, in some translations of the Bible, they actually talk about Moses having a speech impediment. And one of the translations, when they're describing Moses, um, they miss, they miss, um, um, they didn't, uh, what am I trying to say? They didn't quote it properly. And so when they were describing his physical appearance, they actually said that he had horns, but it was actually talking about other characteristics of what he looked like. So Moses really didn't have horns, but people like Klaus Sluter who carved this and Michelangelo have very famous pieces of Moses with horns. But I love it because his wrinkly forehead, notice, oh, I've got it too. Um, notice the wrinkly forehead continues in his horns. We can see his age in his horns. Um, another Duke um, of Barry um, had a series of calendar images painted. And so 
once again, not in the 250, but I would feel hard pressed to not at least show them to you because they're so important to art history. So this is January. Can you guys tell we're in January? Can you tell this is January? Because when we look at it closely, oh, it has that international style stuff, right? And you get to see all these details in particular. There are footprints in the sand and there's little birds eating grain and there's people huddled in, in front of the fire with their, their like they're pulling up their, their skirts so they can warm their feet by the fire. Um, there's people going to art um, to market and really far in the distance is the city and the palace of the Duke. And so every image of these Lindbergh brothers incorporates, oh, there's the close up, um, incorporates elements of the Duke there. So he's always present. Here's an image, I think of February, where we see the court of the Duke. Here you can see a good example of the brocaded fabric. Can you see the Duke here in the blue? And it looks like almost peacock feathers, right? We know he's the Duke because of hieratic scale. He's the biggest and he has this big gold, maybe plate. It doesn't quite work as a halo. I don't know what it is behind him as well, right? And then here's another example of his palace. So always present and all of his people are so happy to serve him. So it's always like images of these happy peasants who are so happy that the Duke is wealthy and rich and living it up, especially in February. All right, so our next piece and our first piece, I should say, um, that we have today that's in year 250 is number 66. And it's often called the Maraud Altarpiece or the Annunciation Triptych. So the Annunciation Triptych tells us what it's the story of. This is the story where Gabriel visits Mary to let her know that she's pregnant. Now, one of the first things that I notice is that this is not taking place in zero AD, right? What's the setting for this painting? Where do, what's, where's the locale? Who can help me out? Aaron, any clue? Any idea? Uh, not really. When you just look at the information, we've been talking so much about, you know, it being late Gothic. Can you see any Gothic characteristics here? Uh, the darker lighting. Right. Um, the darker clothes. Right? You see angular fabrics, you see the city of Ghent with its gothic architecture kind of peeking through. And so um, this is from the workshop of Robert Campion. Now we're not quite sure if Robert Campion is the painter of this. But he was who I was taught was the artist. We don't know exactly if he was the one who painted it or his like his assistants were the ones who painted this. Um, but it's often um, considered to be the work of his workshop. And so for the Maraud altarpiece, he's showing it in contemporary day, right? He's showing it in contemporary day. So the theme for um, this period of early Renaissance, right? Of like early Renaissance, or like Northern art is called consider the nut. It's a little strange. So give me a second here, all right? So many of these paintings are incredibly small. The Maraud altarpiece is a tiny, tiny painting, but it has a lot of detail within it. And what I mean by textured is that it will have realistic depictions of fur and hair and fabric um, and like the texture of leaves and soft flowers and supple skin. It's hard to crack. So like a nut, if you had a walnut, if you put it in your bare hands, it would be hard for you to crack open the nut. And the reason this is important is that there's a lot of symbolism in these paintings. But with effort, you can get to understand the meaning or get to the meat, which would be the nut, right? The inner part that you would eat in the walnut. And so you would get to understand and be able to identify the different symbols. 
and it must be dis dug out. We have what we call disguised symbolism. So in these paintings, there's hidden images that tell a story or add to our meaning of our painting. Right? And then lastly, they're rich in oil. If I were to crumble a walnut in my hand, I would have oily residue in my fingers, or on my fingers. And these paintings were able to have all that detail because of the use of oil paint. Right? So we are going to go ahead and watch um, this paint, um, this smart history on the, um, on the Annunciation triptych. And then we're going to do a little activity based on those symbols. So maybe be listening for symbol information here. So if you were to jot down notes about symbols, I'd put it in content, right? Because it's meaning. We're not. Oh, We're in the Cloisters, which is part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Upper Manhattan, looking at one of their treasures. This is a painting that for a long time was known as the Maraud Altarpiece, but is now known as the Annunciation Triptych. And for a long time, too, we thought that the painter was Robert Campin, but now the current thinking is that this is from the workshop of Robert Campin. Now, Campin was a very successful painter in Tournai, in Northern Europe. He had assistants and apprentices and obviously a large workshop. Tournai was part of the Burgundian Netherlands, this tremendously wealthy place where luxury goods were being produced, where there was a level of mercantile activity that had been rare during the Middle Era. So we have all of this newfound prosperity here in Northern Europe, and there's an increasing interest in commissioning paintings as aids in prayer for people to use in their homes. Well, look at the scale of this painting. This is not a grand altarpiece. This painting is only about two feet tall. Because it's a triptych, it can be folded up and almost put under one's arm and carried to another room. And what's fascinating is that the central scene of the Annunciation looks like it's taking place in the living room of someone who lived in this area of northern Europe in the 1400s. So hold on, we're seeing the Archangel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary and a scene that would have taken place 1500 years before this painting was made and yet we're seeing them in a modern context. When we first see this it sounds like it's meant to secularize this scene, to bring it into the real world, but actually the opposite is true. This biblical scene of the Annunciation is taking place in a Flemish household precisely to make these figures of Mary and Gabriel closer to us, to make our prayer more profound, to bring us closer to God. We know something about the order in which this was painted. The Annunciation was painted first and possibly on spec. That is, it was painted in the hopes that somebody would come along and want to buy it. And we know that the donor was added and then he was married and the woman was added. And the gatekeeper behind her was also added at that time. And it's interesting to think about this being painted on spec. You know, normally paintings are commissioned, but here in an increasingly trade-oriented culture, it makes sense that artists would start painting things in the hope that they would get patrons. Let's start on the left. Let's start with the donors. When we say donors, we're referring to the patrons, the man and his wife who commissioned this painting, and they're shown kneeling, which is a typical position and makes it easy to recognize them as donors. They're set within a walled garden, which has important symbolism in late medieval and Renaissance art, which often refers to Mary's virginity. In Latin, this is known as a hortus conclusus, a closed garden. But we know we're in the Northern Renaissance because we've got an incredible amount of detail. When we think about the Italian Renaissance, we think about artists paying real attention to a rational construction of space and an interest in the anatomy of the body. But here in the North, the artists pay attention to everything, whether it's the nails or the bolts on the door or the plants in the foreground or the birds that are on the ledge of the crenellated wall in the background. I 
I particularly love the rose bush and the foliage in the very foreground. But you mentioned the nails that hold those planks of wood together that make up the door. And if you look at those nails, each one is defined by a bit of a shine and a bit of a shadow. And we can even see traces of rust that is staining the wood below. So we understand that this door is old and has rusted. The level of detail is astonishing. And an interest in light, which we'll see throughout this triptych. This is one of the things that the artists of the Northern Renaissance can do because they have oil paint, they can paint texture and light reflecting on surfaces like metals in a way that artists of the Italian Renaissance who didn't yet have oil paint couldn't do. And we can see that beautifully if we look at the key in that door. We can see that the key has a shine and it is casting a shadow. But this is the large door in the foreground. We can see that level of detail even in the door in the background. And beyond that, we see a Flemish city. And figures on horseback and figures in a doorway and another woman sitting on a bench. The artist is paying attention to everything equally when you would think that some things would be more important than others. So let's move on to the Annunciation scene in the center. The Archangel Gabriel has just appeared to Mary and is announcing to her that she will bear Christ, that she will bear God. This is such a beautiful example of early Northern Renaissance painting, easily identified by the way in which the drapery that's being worn by Gabriel, the Archangel on the left, and the Virgin Mary on the right is portrayed. Look at the sharp folds, the complexity of the way in which that thick fabric falls on the floor. Right, it's not actually the way drapery falls. The cloth is thick and it largely obscures those bodies. When you look at this painting, you're struck immediately by how much stuff, how many things there are in this small room. A bench and a table and a vase and a candle and a towel or shawl in the background and a basin and candles and a fire screen and a fireplace. I mean, there's a lot here. Well, remember, this painting would not have been looked at as we now look at it. We go into a museum, we may spend a few minutes looking at it. This was a painting that would have been seen over and over again. And so there is, I think, a real effort to maintain an interest to develop one's focus. Exactly. And so we can say that everything in this painting, or most things in this painting, would have led the viewer from these physical objects to spiritual ideas. And in fact, everything in this painting has a purpose, has a meaning. And of course, much of that is lost. This painting is hundreds of years old, and art historians speculate about the original meaning of these things. But we can recognize some things with certainty. So for example, that shiny pot in the background that reflects the light from those two windows, that is a symbol of the Virgin Mary, of her purity, of her sinlessness. Perhaps the most obvious symbol is the representation of a small figure holding a cross that seems to be gliding down golden rays that come through the round window that is closest to us. It is heading right for Mary, and this is the Holy Spirit. But it's unusual, because normally we would expect to see a dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. This is the moment when God is made flesh, when one world ends and another world begins, the world where it's possible for human beings to be saved because of Christ's death on the cross. And so a lot of the symbols that we see here have to do with this idea of the incarnation of God and of Mary's virginity. So what's astounding here is the level of realism, the candlestick and the candle, and it's exactly what happens to the smoke when a candle is just snuffed out. It goes straight up and then it curls back and forth on itself. It's so carefully, minutely observed. There are places, for example, in that basin in the niche on the wall where we see a double shadow because there are two slightly different sources of light. So we have incredibly carefully observed items, but the space of the room doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense to us since we live after Brunelleschi developed linear perspective in Italy. Actually, an idea that's just developing as this painting is being made, but those ideas have not been transmitted up to the north yet. So the result is, is that the floor is too steep. The space is not mathematically accurate according to the rules of linear perspective. And we're looking at the top of the table and the side of the table at the same time. That bench is rather thin and elongated, but none of this 
is anything negative. What we have in the Renaissance is this interest in naturalism, whether you're in Northern Europe, in the Burgundian Netherlands, or whether you're in Italy, but a realism that's expressed very differently in each place. For me, the distortions of space actually work very well here. They create a kind of telescoping that brings me in. It creates a kind of closeness to the forms and makes this sumptuous interior even more available. And that makes sense given the purpose of this painting, which was to aid in private devotion, that it would draw you in, that you would need to spend time focusing on these things, which appear to be everyday objects, but which are also symbols of theological, spiritual ideas. Imagine what it must have been like to make this painting. Imagine holding a brush with a single hair on it in order to render the Virgin Mary's golden hair. And I think that emphasis on making is probably most evident in the panel on the right, where we see Joseph, Mary's husband, a carpenter, who is in the act of making. And he's surrounded by his tools. So just like the scene of the Annunciation in the center, there's so much to look at here. Art historians have spent a lot of time trying to decipher what each object means. We're relatively confident that the object that's out the window and the object that is to Joseph's right are mousetraps. St. Augustine said that the cross of the Lord was the devil's mousetrap. The bait by which he was caught was the Lord's death. So even as we're seeing a painting that is celebrating the coming of Christ, we see references to Christ's death. And we also have other references to Christ's death, likely in the objects that surround Joseph. We've got wood on the floor next to him and an axe and perhaps a reference to the cross that Christ was crucified on or even the fact to me that Joseph is boring holes in wood reminds me of the holes from the nails that Christ received in his hands and feet. What that workshop reminds me of is that this is an object that was made by hand that this is not an artist who went to the art supply store and bought his paints and bought a pre-stretched canvas. This is actually painted with oil on panel. And so it is made of wood. It was crafted. I think there is a kind of pride here in the reference to Joseph as a carpenter and the artist here as a maker as well. When we look closely at the Joseph panel, we see an open doorway and the shadow on the wall is sort of odd shape. Well, there's all of these wonderful observed moments. If you look at the shutters that are open against the ceiling, you can see nails and you can see actually the stain marks from the rust of those nails because of course naturally they would be down and outside. And so you can imagine someone in the 15th century looking at these details, looking at the axe, the wood, the tools, even that object that looks like a cross on the work table, and being led from these objects to ideas about Joseph and Christ's sacrifice on the cross and humanity's redemption. If we look through the window, we can see this prosperous city with merchants and people strolling and goods for sale. The mousetrap is out of Joseph's window because it's for sale. So the naturalism of the Renaissance, serving that mercantile culture and their interest in things, but also used here to aid devotion. Okay, hi, hi everyone, welcome back. I actually think that they edited that video and made a new one um, because it doesn't have as much on the, the symbolism as it once had. Um, so keeping in mind, once again, the functionality of this, this is not an altarpiece for a church, right? This is an altarpiece for someone's private home. And we actually know the name of the patrons. Um, he was, um, his last name was Engelbrecht or Engelbright. And the interesting thing is, is that means angel bringer. So maybe this story of the Annunciation would have resonated with him because it's a story of Gabriel coming to um, Mary to tell her about her Immaculate Conception. And then her last name was actually Schinmacher or Schinmaker, which means shrine maker. And so really a personal altar at home is really a personal shrine. Um, so this is a really great piece. It's at the, um, 
at the Metropolitan Museum of Art at what we call the Cloisters in Manhattan, which is a recreation of a, um, of a uh, medieval cloister. Cloisters were often used for private meditation in Christianity and were um, next to churches. So we already sort of talked about this um, for what's depicted, um, but just to make sure that we have some of the basic structure of the content, that this takes place in a Flemish household. Um, it's the scene of the um, Annunciation or the Immaculate Conception. So the Annunciation is Gabriel telling Mary that she's pregnant and the Immac um, Immaculate Conception is that idea that she's impregnated by God. Right, so that little baby on a cross that's zipping through the window, this is the act right before it happens. Um, but it also has on the left side of the panel, our patrons. So we have Ingelbrecht and Schreinmacher, and then we have Joseph on the right. Um, so we have his workshop. So the format for this is that it's in three, so it is a triptych. So that would be part of the form. And thinking about our theme with form, one of the reasons why it looks the way that it does, it has all those small textured details, right? And that's through oil paint. Now, um, looking at the time, um, I wanted to do this activity, um, but I thought the video did a better job of going through some of the sim symbols with you. So I think I'm actually gonna skip it. So I apologize for uh, taking away something that's a little bit more interactive for you. But let's go ahead and diagnose some of the symbolism that you can add to your content. So remember part of the theme is hard to crack, lots of symbolism but you can totally understand it with through, through some investigation. So there are many images of flowers in this painting. There's images in the garden, as well as images in the interior of the Annunciation scene. And so these flowers often represent the Virgin. Remember that during the Gothic, there's a rise of Marian devotion. So people believe that Mary was a holy figure. Right? Remember that in, in the Bible, it's not really, she's not depicted that way. But in Gothic time, Byzantine time, we often see this elevation of her status, this idea that she is the giver of, or the bringer of life to that God. And so different um, flowers have different symbols of Mary. So violets represent her, human, her humility, li lilies, white lilies, her chastity. Um, and roses, we talked about a rose window already when we looked at Gothic architecture. So the roses in the garden would often represent her as well. We have other things that represent Mary. So like that basin that they mentioned in the back in the video, it was one of the few symbols that they actually talked about. This, this pure vessel, right? That a, preg a pregnant female is a vessel for a child um, represents her purity. But another interesting thing, when you do a combination of the water and this towel or this, sh this prayer shawl in the back, um, let's say it's a towel. Any idea what this could symbolize for a Christian? It often happens to little babies by their the parents take them to a church and they often baptize them. So baptize is a way of purification, but also a way of showing that the child is committed to their Christian education. And so that combination of those two things might be beyond just Mary and be a symbol of baptism, right? The candle snuffed out. They talked about how it was, um, you know, how beautiful the detail was, but God or Jesus was considered the light of the world. And what would the snuffing out of the light of the world mean? What could be that hidden sim symbolism there? Who can write that in the chat for me? What would a snuffed out candle, snuffed out light of the world mean? Correct, it could be his crucifixion, right? So it could symbolize his crucifixion. Um, so, it also could represent the divine light that God um, became man 
And then of course we have that little interesting baby writing it. Lots of parts of um, this image shows her religious devotion. This is a kneeling bench. Can you guys see if you're Catholic or been to a Catholic church before, you probably recognize a kneeling bench there. So there's a lot of piety. The fluttering of the of the pages shows the, the wind that's created by that baby flying through the window. There's all these little elements and details. So on the outside, we have the Virgin um, with the rose bush to show her, cha her charity. Like I said, we have our images of our patrons and it's really easy to tell if a piece is from the North or if it's from the South. So when I say South, I mean Italy and North, I normally mean Flanders um, when we talk about the Renaissance. In Italy, they always show pro the patrons in profile. So you only see one eye, nose, and mouth. But in the north, they typically show them in three quarters. So they have a slight tilt to their body, but you still see the sides of their face. Um, but then also in the other scene, we have Joseph and his workshop. And so in the video, they mentioned all the wood that could be talking about the crucifixion, but also, um, there's other symbols as well. The holes that he's drilling there might represent the, the process of wine making, right? And remember that the wine in the Eucharist represents the blood of Jesus. So often people equate that drilling of the holes as um, the, the fun that they'll be used to press grapes through to create the um, wine, right? And so all of this detail is achieved through the use of oil. And you can see that there's a light source. Notice that the light is coming from the left. Can you guys see how the light's shining in on the left? So she's got highlight on her nose and shadow on her right cheek that makes her look more realistic and more believable. But totally uncharacteristic with strange not linear perspective, all the objects go to their own sort of vanishing point. We have that tilted table, right? And here you can see some of the differences between what's going on in the North and the South. This is Frau Angelico's Annunciation, and you can see how classically inspired the works of Italy are going to become, um, whereas the things in the North are much more based on little minute details. Okay. So we're gonna move into our last piece before our quiz. And so we're gonna to once to be looking at symbolism and style of the, 14th, uh, the 1400s in Northern art. And the most famous artist of this day is Jan van Eyck. Jan van Eyck um, grew up in the workshop of his brother Hubert and his brother passed away. And so he continued the work. So many pieces were made by both of them or um, one or the other and their assistants. So here's an, two panels that come from an altar piece based on the crucifixion and the last judgment. Probably the most famous painting by Jan van Eyck is the Ghent altar piece. Now, the Ghent altarpiece is an enormous altarpiece. Instead of a real small private one like the Marode, this one is enormous. Now it's not in the 250 and I do want to maybe get some time to review. So I'm not gonna watch this video, but something interesting to know is that it's big. It was made for the city. So it was to kind of show people's love and devotion for their city and for their faith. And it opens and closes, um, to reveal different sections. So this part that we see here that's nice and um, that's next to um, the diagram is when it's in the closed position. And here you can see the patrons and their patron saints. And then we have another scene of the Annunciation. And then when it opens, we have um, the adoration of the lamb. And so this um, was just cleaned. You might have seen it in the news. It was on social media a lot. The, the lamb that's in the very center of this has strange human characteristics. He looks like a person. Who could the lamb symbolize? This is adoration of the lamb. What could the lamb symbolize?
Jesus would be considered a sacrificial lamb, a sacrificial lamb. So this is the adoration of him. So this actually has a depiction of God in it. Can anyone find God? Where would God be in an altarpiece? Turn on your audio and let me know. Where's God? At the center. At the center. He's the biggest figure. He's dead center. We don't have a lot of depictions of God, but I know he's God because he has the crown of the Pope on his head. And so he's in the center. He's the largest figure. And then we have Mary and um, John, not Joseph, Mary and John on his sides. And we have choirs of angels. And then we have um, Adam and Eve. So the reason that Jesus was needed was because of original sin. So that's on the top section. And then the bottom section is all the, about the adoration of the lamb. So all these contemporary people from Ghent had their depictions painted in these different panels. So we have clergy, we have wealthy business people, we have um, uh, like the elite socials of social elite of the day, all with imagery based on Ghent. Um, even on the front panel, we can see the city of Ghent through the windows with Gothic architecture. Now, one of the reasons that this is so famous is that this has been stolen several times in history. Um, probably the most famous time it was stolen was during World War II. If you ever read the book or watched the movie Monuments Men, they find the Ghent altarpiece at the very end of that movie. Um, I would highly recommend um, either the book or the movie. All right, so here's an, a self-portrait of Jan van Eyck, and this represents humanism, right? And how does it represent humanism? Look how confident he is. Even with three quarter, he is making eye contact with you. This is a great little portrait because it shows all this great little um, detail. You actually can see the scruff on his chin, and you see the wrinkles around his um, eyes, and you see reflections in his hair uh, or in his um, in his eyelashes, and he's wearing the a turban on his head. And that's normally a signifier of an artist because they would wrap their hair in fabric so that they didn't get paint because they'd be working on these big altar pieces or ceilings or walls, and you wouldn't want paint to get in your hair because you don't take a bath or a shower every day. Right? So in order to keep themselves clean, they'd often wrap their heads. And then his personal motto is actually um, on the border of his um, frame, which is all about, once again, man can achieve. So our theme, right? So the last piece that we have for um, late Gothic, early Renaissance, is the Arnolfini portrait. And so the artist of this is Jan van Eyck. Um, I think we're gonna skip the video for this, um, but I would very much suggest that you watch it. Um, and so we're gonna focus on the function of this piece as well as the symbolism, and then just do a quick review about how it reflects um, Northern painting, All right? So just take a moment. Um, and maybe even in the content on your note takers, this is image number 68. Um, think about the theme, right, when you're doing this, but can you tell where the setting is? Like, where does this take place? And who are the characters, right? So see if you can figure out what's going on in this painting. So just take a few moments and jot down a few notes. So it takes place in a private setting. What's their relationship? Who are they? Husband and wife. More than likely, they are husband and wife. Thank you, Katie. So a lot of times when people look at this, it used to be. So when I studied art history, we called this the Arnolfini wedding portrait. 
And so a lot of um, early art historians believe that this was a portrait of a wedding. But when they did some more analysis on it, they figured out that it was actually painted well after he, I think one of them was dead. And so it was made se like several years after um, the actual wedding. So today we tend to think of it either as a double portrait, so a portrait of husband and wife, a memorial to her, right? So she's the one who passed away. So it could be a memorial to this beloved wife. It could also represent or document their betrothal. So the fact that they got engaged, it would almost be like your engagement photos today, right? Um, and then lastly, it would be the, the privilege of a husband to make a legal or financial decision for an absent wife. It could document um, his legal right over her property, which is kind of strange to me, right? So most of the time we think about this as being more a patrol. A lot of times when people look at this, they think that she's pregnant and she's actually not. This was high fashion of the day. Women wanted to look fertile. And this happens again in Victorian England in the 1800s. Clothing would often be like high-waisted and then would billow out from the belly so that it would look like a woman was fertile and could have many children, right? To kind of show her um, part in society, right? And so then lastly, sometimes people consider it to be a wedding portrait. Right? So this one has symbols as well. This has some really fun symbols. Um, if I were going to break it apart, you'll see that it's pretty much divided in half. And if you look at the left, right, you see the left of the painting, we basically have a representation of his world, right? Um, Arnolfini was part of a, he was a, a banker and he worked for the Medici of Italy and they were extremely wealthy. We'll talk about them as being patrons of the arts later. And so he is dressed in a hat and a lovely fur coat. It's like he's ready to go out into the world and he's located next to an open window. So it pretty much shows his domain is outside of the house. And then on the right side, we have her in her typical clothing that she would wear around the house. And we have her in the part that's more of that private setting of the household. So she's next to that uh, bed slash couch that would be used inside the household, right? At the very top, there's a chandelier and there's a candle. And so once again, the candle represents Jesus as the light of the world, and one of them is extinguished. So there's smoke billowing from it as well, right? There is a mirror. If you look in the very back center, there is a mirror. Oh, shoot. I thought I had the detail of it. Darn it. We'll see it in a little bit. In that mirror, we actually can see it's the kind that a shop, a shop owner would hold. So it's a convex mirror. And so you can actually see a lot of the room. It actually has Jan van Eyck in it and an assistant. So we can see the painter here. We can see the rest of the room. And he even signed his name. Jan van Eyck was here as if he was witnessing the betrothal of this happy union of this happy wife and husband. There are rosary beads. Um, next to it as well. And the, the um, mirror itself has the passions of the Christ scenes around it as well. It also has a broom um, and a bedpost nobule that has um, St. Margaret, who is the patron saint of pregnant women. Um, so there's all these kind of symbols of like cleaning the household, wife, kind of um, pregnancy. And then there's some other beautiful symbols of fruit. Now, in the North, peaches and citrus were really expensive, but fruit is also a symbol of fertility. We saw that, right, when we looked at some of our Hindu art or our Buddhist art. And so those symbols are supposed to show a fruitful return of the family, right? Then we have shoes off, two pairs of shoes sitting on, on the floor, what could shoes off represent? 
We saw this at the palette of Namar. Do you guys remember what shoes off represent? Augustus of Primaporta also has his shoes off. Shoes off represent what? Eva, what do you think? Do you remember? Um, that they're stepping on like holy ground. Right, and so the act that this is possibly a document of their union, right? It represents the sacredness of this event. And then lastly, we have this cute little dog, right? So we have really expensive breed of dog and dogs are symbols of fidelity, right? Man's best friend, a constant companion, someone who will always be by your side. So here we can see the mirror close up with his signature and we see the artist and we can see the, the backs of the happy couple. All right. So this is some other images of Flemish painting, um, kind of the second generation that happens afterwards. And you can see that that style um, continues. So the people learning from, um, learning from um, Campion and Van Eyck and so on. Okay, so I would like to play one Kahoot with you since we have been in medieval before break and after break. I like just to do at least one, but I have two more here if you want to do any of these reviews on your own. Does that sound good for you guys? Let's do a little bit of Kahoot. And then once again, remember we have our quiz on, um, excuse me, on Thursday. I apologize for not clicking on this sooner. I wasn't quite sure if we would get to it. Mm -hmm. oh, I should have hit logged in, sorry. Oh. Any questions while well, this is loading? Any questions? Let's see if I can get into it this way. You guys all okay? Any parts of your notes seem kind of empty? I'm gonna stop my video now.